You're listening to Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. I'm Marilyn of Midwest Covencast. Here in Season 3 of Weekend Reads, we will be making our way through the 1922 abridgment of Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough. You can visit MidwestCovencast.com to find podcast extras, including a free online copy of the text. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on Patreon for access to additional materials, like a serialized official Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads ebook with additional notes about the text and some editorial modernizations straight from, well, me. Now, Coven, it is time to cozy up with your coffee or tea and enjoy this episode of Weekend Reads. Chapter 24 The Killing of the Divine King. Subsection 1. The Mortality of the Gods Man has created gods in his own likeness, and being himself mortal, he has naturally supposed his creatures to be in the same sad predicament. Thus, the Greenlanders believe that a wind could kill their most powerful god, and that he would certainly die if he touched a dog. When they heard of the Christian god, they kept asking if he never died, and being informed that he did not, they were much surprised and said that he must be a very great god indeed. In answer to the enquiries of Colonel Dodge, a North American Indian stated that the world was made by the great spirit. Being asked which great spirit he meant, the good one or the bad one, oh, neither of them, replied he, the great spirit that made the world is dead long ago. He could not possibly have lived as long as this. A tribe in the Philippine Islands told the Spanish conquerors that the grave of the creator was upon the top of Mount Kabunian. Hetsi Abib, a god or divine hero of the Hottentots, died several times and came to life again. His graves are generally to be met with in narrow defiles between mountains. When the Hottentots pass one of them, they throw a stone on it for good luck, sometimes muttering, give us plenty of cattle. The grave of Zeus, the great god of Greece, was shown to visitors in Crete as late as about the beginning of our era. The body of Dionysus was buried at Delphi beside the golden statue of Apollo, and his tomb bore the inscription, Here lies Dionysus, dead, the son of Semele. According to one account, Apollo himself was buried at Delphi, for Pythagoras is said to have carved an inscription on his tomb, setting forth how the god had been killed by the python and buried under the tripod. The great gods of Egypt themselves were not exempt from the common lot. They too grew old and died. But when, at a later time, the discovery of the art of embalming gave a new lease of life to the souls of the dead by preserving their bodies for an indefinite time from corruption, the deities were permitted to share the benefit of an invention which held out to gods as well as to men a reasonable hope of immortality. Every province then had the tomb and mummy of its dead god. The mummy of Osiris was to be seen at Mendes. Thinus boasted the mummy of Anhuri and Heliopolis rejoiced in the possession of that of Tumu. The high gods of Babylon also, though they appeared to their worshippers only in dreams and visions, were conceived to be human in their bodily shape, human in their passions, and human in their fate. For like men, they were born into the world, and like men, they loved and fought and died. Subsection 2. Kings Killed When Their Strength Fails if the high gods who dwell remote from the fret and fever of this earthly life are yet believed to die at last, it is not to be expected that a god who lodges in a frail tabernacle of flesh should escape the same fate, though we hear of African kings who have imagined themselves immortal by virtue of their sorceries. Now primitive peoples, as we have seen, sometimes believe that their safety and even that of the world is bound up with the life of one of these godmen or human incarnations of the divinity. Naturally, therefore, they take the utmost care of his life out of a regard for their own. But no amount of care and precaution will prevent the man-god from growing old and feeble, and at last dying. His worshippers have to lay their account with this sad necessity and to meet it as best they can. The danger is a formidable one, for if the course of nature is dependent on the man-god's life, what catastrophes may not be expected from the gradual enfeeblement of his powers and their final extinction and death? There is only one way of averting these dangers. The man-god must be killed as soon as he shows symptoms that his powers are beginning to fail, and his soul must be transferred to a vigorous successor before it has been seriously impaired by the threatened decay." 
The advantages of thus putting the man-god to death instead of allowing him to die of old age and disease are, to the savage, obvious enough. For if the man-god dies what we call a natural death, it means, according to the savage, that his soul has either voluntarily departed from his body and refuses to return, or more commonly that it has been extracted, or at least attained in its wanderings by a demon or a sorcerer. In any of these cases, the soul of the man-god is lost to his worshippers, and with it their prosperity is gone, and their very existence endangered. Even if they could arrange to catch the soul of the dying god as it left his lips or his nostrils, and so transfer it to a successor, this would not affect their purpose, for, dying of disease, his soul would necessarily leave his body in the last stage of weakness and exhaustion, and so enfeebled it would continue to drag out a languid, inert existence in any body to which it might be transferred." whereas by slaying him as worshippers could, in the first place, make sure of catching his soul as it escaped and transferring it to a suitable successor, and in the second place, by putting him to death before his natural force was abated, they would secure that the world should not fall into decay with the decay of the man-god. Every purpose, therefore, was answered, and all dangers averted by thus killing the man-god and transferring his soul, while yet at its prime, to a vigorous successor. The mystic kings of fire and water in Cambodia are not allowed to die a natural death. Hence, when one of them is seriously ill, and the elders think that he cannot recover, they stab him to death. The people of Congo believed, as we have seen, that if their pontiff, the Shitome, were to die a natural death, the world would perish, and the earth, which he alone sustained by his power and merit, would immediately be annihilated." Accordingly, when he fell ill and seemed likely to die, the man who was destined to be his successor entered the pontiff's house with a rope or a club and strangled or clubbed him to death. The Ethiopian kings of Mero were worshipped as gods, but whenever the priests chose, they sent a messenger to the king, ordering him to die and alleging an oracle of the gods as their authority for the command. This command the kings always obeyed down to the reign of Ergomenes, a contemporary of Ptolemy II, king of Egypt, having received a Greek education which emancipated him from the superstitions of his countrymen, Ergomenes ventured to disregard the command of the priests, and entering the golden temple with a body of soldiers, put the priests to the sword. Customs of the same sort appear to have prevailed in this part of Africa down to modern times. In some tribes of Fizokal, the king had to administer justice daily under a certain tree. If from sickness or any other cause he was unable to discharge his duty for three whole days, he was hanged on the tree in a noose, which contained two razors so arranged that when the noose was drawn tight by the weight of the king's body, they cut his throat. A custom of putting their divine kings to death at the first symptoms of infirmity or old age prevailed until lately, if indeed it is even now extinct and not merely dormant, among the Shilluk of the White Nile, and in recent years it has been carefully investigated by Dr. C. G. Seligman. The reverence which the Shilluk pay to their king appears to arise chiefly from the conviction that he is a reincarnation of the spirit of Nyakong the semi-divine hero who founded the dynasty and settled the tribe in their present territory. It is a fundamental article of the Shilluk Creed that the spirit of the divine or semi-divine Nyakang is incarnate in the reigning king, who is accordingly himself invested to some extent with the character of a divinity. But while the Shilluk hold their kings in high, indeed religious reverence, and take every precaution against their accidental death, nevertheless they cherish the conviction that the king must not be allowed to become ill or senile, lest with his diminishing vigor the cattle should sicken and fail to bear their increase, the crops should rot in the fields, and man, stricken with disease, should die in ever-increasing numbers. To prevent these calamities, it used to be the regular custom with the Shillik to put the king to death whenever he showed signs of ill health or failing strength. One of the fatal symptoms of decay was taken to be an incapacity to satisfy the sexual passions of his wives, of whom he has very many, distributed in large number of houses at Fashoda. When this ominous weakness manifested itself, 
The wives reported it to the chiefs, who are popularly said to have intimated to the king his doom by spreading a white cloth over his face and knees as he lay slumbering in the heat of the sultry afternoon. Executions soon followed the sentence of death. A hut was specially built for the occasion. The king was led into it and lay down with his head resting on the lap of a nubile virgin. The door of the hut was then walled up, and the couple were left without food, water, or fire to die of hunger and suffocation. This was the old custom, but it was abolished some five generations ago on account of the excessive sufferings of one of the kings who perished in this way. It is said that the chiefs announce his fate to the king, and that afterwards he is strangled in a hut which has been specially built for the occasion. From Dr. Seligman's inquiries, it appears that not only was the Shulik king liable to be killed with due ceremony at the first symptoms of incipient decay, but even while he was yet in the prime of health and strength, he might be attacked at any time by a rival and have to defend his crown in a combat to the death. According to the common Shillock tradition, any son of a king had the right thus to fight the king in possession and, if he succeeded in killing him, to reign in his stead. As every king had a large harem and many sons, the number of possible candidates for the throne at any time may well have been not inconsiderable, and the reigning monarch must have carried his life in his hand. But the attack on him could only take place with any prospect of success at night, for during the day the king surrounded himself with his friends and bodyguards, and an aspirant to the throne could hardly hope to cut his way through them and strike home. It was otherwise at night— for then the guards were dismissed, and the king was alone in his enclosure, with his favorite wives, and there was no man near to defend him except a few herdsmen, whose hut stood a little way off. The hours of darkness were therefore the season of peril for the king. It is said that he used to pass them in constant watchfulness, prowling round his huts, fully armed, peering into the black set shadows, or himself standing silent and alert, like a sentinel on duty, in some dark corner. When at last his rival appeared, the fight would take place in grim silence, broken only by the clash of spears and shields, for it was a point of honor with the king not to call the herdsmen to his assistance. Like Naya Kang himself, their founder, each of the Shulik kings, after death is worshipped at a shrine, which is erected over his grave, and the grave of a king is always in the village where he was born. The tomb shrine of a king resembles the shrine of Naya Kang, consisting of a few huts enclosed by a fence. One of the huts is built over the king's grave. The others are occupied by the guardians of the shrine. Indeed, the shrines of Nyakang and the shrines of the kings are scarcely to be distinguished from each other, and the religious rituals observed at all of them are identical in form and vary only in matters of detail, the variations being due apparently to the far greater sanctity attributed to the shrines of Nyakang. The grave shrines of the kings are tended by certain old men or women who correspond to the guardians of the shrines of Nyakang. They are usually widows or old men servants of the deceased king, and when they die, they are succeeded in their office by their descendants. Moreover, cattle are dedicated to the grave shrines of the kings, and sacrifices are offered at them, just as at the shrines of Naya Kang. In general, the principal element in the religion of the Shilik would seem to be the worship which they pay to their sacred or divine kings, whether dead or alive. These are believed to be animated by a single divine spirit, which has been transmitted from the semi-mythical, but probably in substance historical, founder of the dynasty through all his successors to the present day. Hence, regarding their kings as incarnate divinities, on whom the welfare of men, of cattle, and of corn implicitly depends, the Shilik naturally pay them the greatest respect and take every care of them. And however strange it may seem to us, their custom of putting the divine king to death as soon as he shows signs of ill health or failing strength springs directly from their profound veneration for him and from their anxiety to preserve him, or rather, the divine spirit by which he is animated, in the most perfect state of efficiency. Nay, we must go further and say that their practice of regicide is the best proof they can give of the high regard in which they hold their kings. For they believe, as we have seen, that the king's life or spirit is so sympathetically bound up with the prosperity of the whole country that if he fell ill or grew senile, the cattle would sicken and cease to multiply, the crops would rot in the fields, and men would perish of widespread disease. 
Hence, in their opinion, the only way of averting these calamities is to put the king to death while he is still hale and hearty, in order that the divine spirit which he has inherited from his predecessors may be transmitted in turn by him to his successor, while it is still in full vigor, and has not yet been impaired by the weakness of disease and old age. In this connection, the particular symptom, which is commonly said to seal the king's death warrant, is highly significant. When he can no longer satisfy the passions of his numerous wives, in other words, when he has ceased, whether partially or wholly, to be able to reproduce his kind, it is time for him to die, and to make room for a more vigorous successor. Taken along with the other reasons, which are alleged for putting the king to death, this one suggests the fertility of men, of cattle, and of the crops is believed to depend sympathetically on the generative power of the king, so that the complete failure of that power in him would involve a corresponding failure in men, animals, and plants, and would thereby entail at no distant date the entire extinction of all life, whether human, animal, or vegetable." No wonder that with such a danger before their eyes, the Shillick should be most careful not to let the king die what we should call a natural death of sickness or old age. It is characteristic of their attitude towards the death of the kings that they refrain from speaking of it as death. They do not say that a king has died, but simply that he has gone away, like his divine ancestors, Nyakang and Dag, the two first kings of the dynasty both of whom are reported not to have died but to have disappeared the similar legends of the mysterious disappearance of early kings in other lands for example at rome and in uganda may well point to a similar custom of putting them to death for the purpose of preserving their life on the whole the theory and practice of the divine kings of the shillik correspond very nearly to the theory and practice of the priests of nemi the kings of the wood if my view of the latter is correct in both we see a series of divine kings on whose life the fertility of men of cattle and of vegetation is believed to depend and who are put to death whether in single combat or otherwise in order that their divine spirit may be transmitted to their successor in full vigor uncontaminated by the weakness and decay of sickness or old age because any such denigration on the part of the king would in the opinion of his worshippers entail a corresponding denigration on man king on cattle, and on the crops. Some points in this explanation of the custom of putting divine kings to death, particularly the method of transmitting their divine souls to their successors, will be dealt with more fully in the sequel. Meantime, we pass to other examples of the general practice. The Dinka are a congress of independent tribes in the valley of the White Nile. They are essentially a pastoral people, passionately devoted to the care of their numerous herds of oxen, though they also keep sheep and goats, and the women cultivate small quantities of millet and sesame. For their crops, and above all for their pastures, they depend on the regularity of the rains. In seasons of prolonged drought, they are said to be reduced to great extremities. Hence, the rainmaker is a very important personage among them to this day. Indeed, the men in authority, whom travelers dub chiefs or sheiks, are in fact the actual or potential rainmakers of the tribe or community. Each of them is believed to be animated by the spirit of a great rainmaker, which has come down to him through a succession of rainmakers, and in virtue of this inspiration, a successful rainmaker enjoys very great power and is consulted on all important matters." Yet in spite, or rather in virtue, of the high honor in which he is held, no Dinka rainmaker is allowed to die a natural death of sickness or old age, for the Dinka believe that if such an untoward event were to happen, the tribe would suffer from disease and famine, and the herds would not yield their increase. So, when a rainmaker feels that he is growing old and infirm, he tells his children that he wishes to die. Among the Agar Dinka, a large grave is dug, and the rainmaker lies down in it. Surrounded by his friends and relatives from time to time, he speaks to the people, recalling the past history of the tribe, reminding them how he has ruled and advised them, and instructing them how they are to act in the future. Then, when he has concluded his admonition, he bids them cover him up. So the earth is thrown down on him as he lies in the grave, and he soon dies of suffocation. Such, with minor variations, appears to be the regular end of the honorable career of a rainmaker in the Dinka tribes. The Cora der Dinka told Dr. Seligman that when they have dug the grave for their rainmaker, they strangle him in his house. 
the father and paternal uncle of one of Dr. Seligman's informants, had both been rainmakers, and both had been killed in the most regular and orthodox fashion. Even if a rainmaker is quite young, he will be put to death should he seem likely to perish of disease. Further, every precaution is taken to prevent a rainmaker from dying an accidental death, for such an end, though not nearly so serious a matter as death from illness or old age, would be sure to entail sickness on the tribe. As soon as a rainmaker is killed, his valuable spirit is supposed to pass to a suitable successor, whether a son or other near-blood relation. In the Central Africa kingdom of Bunyoro, down to recent years, custom required that as soon as the king fell seriously ill or began to break up from age, he should die by his own hand. For, according to an old prophecy, the throne would pass away from the dynasty if ever the king were to die a natural death. He killed himself by draining a poisoned cup. If he faltered or were too ill to ask for the cup, it was his wife's duty to administer the poison. When the king of Kabanga on the upper Congo seems near his end, the sorcerers put a rope round his neck, which they draw gradually tighter till he dies. If the king of Genjiro happens to be wounded in war, he is put to death by his comrades, or if they fail to kill him, by his kinsfolk, however hard he may beg for mercy. They say they do it that he may not die by the hands of his enemies. The Jukos are a heathen tribe of the Benue River, a great tributary of the Niger. In their country, the town of Gatri is ruled by a king who is elected by the big men of the town as follows. When in the opinion of the big men the king has reigned long enough, they give out that the king is sick, a formula understood by all to mean that they are going to kill him though the intention is never put more plainly. They then decide who is to be the next king. How long he is to reign is settled by the influential men at a meeting. The question is put and answered by each man, throwing on the ground a little piece of stick, for each year he thinks the new king should rule. The king is then told, and a great feast prepared, at which the king gets drunk on guinea corn beer. After that, he is speared, and the man who was chosen becomes king. Thus, each Jugo king knows that he cannot have very many more years to live, and that he is certain of his predecessor's fate. This, however, does not seem to frighten candidates. The same custom of king-killing is said to prevail at Kwande and Wukare, as well as at Gatri. In three Hausa kingdoms of Gobir, Katsina, and Dora, in northern Nigeria, as soon as a king showed signs of failing health or growing infirmity, an official who bore the title of killer of the elephant appeared and throttled him. The Matiamvo, a great king or emperor in the interior of Angola, one of the inferior kings of the country by name Chala, gave to a Portuguese expedition the following account of the manner in which the Matiamvo comes by his end. It has been customary, he said, for our Matiamvos to die either in war or by violent death, and the present Matiamvo must meet this last fate as, in consequence of his great exactions, he has lived long enough. When we come to this understanding and decide that he should be killed, we invite him to make war with our enemies, on which occasion we all accompany him and his family to the war when we lose some of our people. If he escapes unhurt, we return to the war again and fight for three or four days. We then suddenly abandon him and his family to their fate, leaving him in the enemy's hands. Seeing himself thus deserted, he causes his throne to be erected, and sitting down, calls his family around him. He then orders his mother to approach. She kneels at his feet. He first cuts off her head, then decapitates his sons in succession, next his wives and relatives, and last of all, his most beloved wife, called Anakulo. This slaughter being accomplished, the Matiamvo, dressed in all his pomp, awaits his own death, which immediately follows, by an officer sent by the powerful neighboring chiefs, Kanaquina and Kanika. This officer first cuts off his legs and arms at the joints, and lastly he cuts off his head, after which the head of the officer is struck off. All the potentates retire from the encampment in order not to witness his death. It is my duty to remain and witness his death, and to mark the place where the head and arms have been deposited by the two great chiefs, the enemies of the Matiambo. They also take possession of all the property belonging to the deceased monarch and his family, which they convey to their own residence. I then provide for the funeral of the mutilated remains of the late Matiamvo, after which I retire to his capital and proclaim the new government. 
I then returned to where the head, legs, and arms had been deposited, and for forty slaves I ransomed them, together with the merchandise and other property belonging to the deceased, which I give up to the new Matiamvo, who has been proclaimed. This is what has happened to many Matiamvos, and what must happen to the present one. It appears to have been a Zulu custom to put the king to death as soon as he began to have wrinkles or gray hairs. At least this seems implied in the following passage written by one who resided for some time at the court of the notorious Zulu tyrant Shaka in the early part of the 19th century. The extraordinary violence of the king's rage with me was mainly occasioned by that absurd nostrum, the hair oil, with the notion of which Mr. Farewell had impressed him as being a specific for removing all indications of age. From the first moment of his having heard that such a preparation was attainable, he evinced a solicitude to procure it, and on every occasion never forgot to remind us of his anxiety respecting it more especially on our departure on the mission his injunctions were particularly directed to this object it will be seen that it is one of the barbarous customs of the zulas in their choice or election of their kings that he must neither have wrinkles nor gray hairs as they are both distinguishing marks of disqualification for becoming a monarch of a warlike people it is also equally indispensable that their king should never exhibit those proofs of having become unfit and incompetent to reign it is therefore important that they should conceal these indications so long as they possibly can chaka had become greatly apprehensive of the approach of gray hairs which would at once be the signal for him to prepare to make his exit from his sublunary world it being always followed by the death of the monarch the writer to whom we are indebted for this instructive anecdote of the hair oil omits to specify the mode in which a gray-haired and wrinkled zulu chief used to make his exit from this sublunary world but on analogy we may conjecture that he was killed the custom of putting kings to death as soon as they suffered from any personal defect prevailed two centuries ago in the kaffir kingdom of sofala we have seen that these kings of sofala were regarded as gods by their people being entreated to give rain or sunshine according as each might be wanted nevertheless a slight bodily blemish such as the loss of a tooth was considered a sufficient cause for putting one of these godmen to death as we learn from the following passage of an old portuguese historian it was formerly the custom of the kings of this land to commit suicide by taking poison when any disaster or natural physical defect fell upon them, such as impotence, infectious disease, the loss of their front teeth by which they were disfigured, or any other deformity or affliction. To put an end to such defects, they killed themselves, saying that the king should be free from any blemish, and if not, it was better for his honor that he should die and seek another life, where he would be made whole, for there everything was perfect. Perfect. But the Quiteve, king, who reigned when I was in those parts, would not imitate his predecessors in this, being discreet and dreaded as he was. For having lost a front tooth, he caused it to be proclaimed throughout the kingdom that all should be aware that he had lost a tooth and should recognize him when they saw him without it. And if his predecessors killed themselves for such things, they were very foolish, and he would not do so. On the contrary, he would be very sorry when the time came for him to die a natural death, for his life was very necessary to preserve his kingdom and defend it from his enemies, and he recommended his successors to follow his example. The king of Sofala, who dared to survive the loss of his front tooth, was thus a bold reformer like Ergomenes, king of Ethiopia. We may conjecture that the ground for putting the Ethiopian kings to death was, as in the case of the Zulu and Sofala kings, the appearance on their person of any bodily defect or sign of decay, and that the oracle which the priests alleged as the authority for the royal execution was to the effect that great calamities would result from the reign of a king who had any blemish on his body, just as an oracle warned Sparta against a lame reign, that is, the reign of a lame king. It is some confirmation of this conjecture that the kings of Ethiopia were chosen for their size, strength, and beauty long before the custom of killing them was abolished. To this day, the sultan of Wadai must have no obvious bodily defect, and the king of Angoy cannot be crowned if he has a single blemish, such as a broken or a filed tooth or the scar of an old wound. According to the book of Akal and many other authorities, no king who was afflicted with a personal blemish might reign over Ireland at Tara. 
Hence, when the great King Cormac Mac Art lost one eye by an accident, he at once abdicated. Many days' journey to the northeast of Abome, the old capital of Dahomey, lies the king of Ayo. The Aeos are governed by a king no less absolute than the king of Dahomey, yet subject to a regulation of state at once humiliating and extraordinary. When the people have conceived an opinion of his ill government, which is sometimes insidiously infused into them by the artifice of his discontented ministers, they send a deputation to him with a present of parrot's eggs, as a mark of its authenticity to represent to him that the burden of government must have so far fatigued him that they consider it full time for him to repose from his cares and indulge himself with a little sleep. He thanks his subjects for their attention to his ease, retires to his own apartment as if to sleep, and there gives directions to his women to strangle him. This is immediately executed, and his son quietly ascends the throne upon the usual terms of holding the reins of government, no longer than whilst he merits the approbation of the people." About the year 1774, a king of Ayo, whom his ministers attempted to remove in the customary manner, positively refused to accept the proffered parrot's eggs at their hands, telling them that he had no mind to take a nap, but on the contrary was resolved to watch for the benefit of his subjects. The ministers, surprised and indignant at his recalcitrancy, raised a rebellion, but were defeated with great slaughter, and thus, by his spirited conduct, the king freed himself from the tyranny of his counselors and established a new precedent for the guidance of his successors. However, the old custom seems to have revived and persisted until late in the 19th century, for a Catholic missionary writing in 1884 speaks of the practice as if it were still in vogue. Another missionary writing in 1881 thus describes the usage of the Egbus and the Yorubas of West Africa. Among the customs of the country, one of the most curious is unquestionably that of judging and punishing the king. Should he have earned the hatred of his people by exceeding his rights, one of his counselors, on whom the heavy duty is laid, requires of the prince that he shall go to sleep, which means simply take poison and die. If his courage fails him at the supreme moment, a friend renders him this last service, and quietly, without betraying the secret, they prepare the people for the news of the king's death. In Yoruba, the thing is managed a little differently. When a son is born to the king of Oyo, they make a model of the infant's right foot in clay and keep it in the house of the elders, Agbone. If the king fails to observe the customs of the country, a messenger, without speaking a word, shows him his child's foot. The king knows what that means. He takes poison and goes to sleep. The old Prussians acknowledged as their supreme lord a ruler who governed them in the name of the gods and was known as God's Mouth. When he felt himself weak and ill, if he wished to leave a good name behind him, he had a great heap made of thorn bushes and straw, on which he mounted and delivered a long sermon to the people, exhorting them to serve the gods and promising to go to the gods and speak for the people. Then he took some of the perpetual fire which burned in front of the holy oak tree, and lighting the pile with it, burned himself to death. Subsection 3. Kings Killed at the End of a Fixed Term in the cases hitherto described, the divine king or priest is suffered by his people to retain office until some outward defect, some visible symptom of failing health or advancing age, warns them that he is no longer equal to the discharge of his divine duties. But not until such symptoms have made their appearance is he put to death. Some peoples, however, appear to have thought it unsafe to wait for even the slightest symptom of decay, and have preferred to kill the king while he was still in full vigor of life. Accordingly, they have fixed a term beyond which he might not reign, and at the close of which he must die, the term fixed upon being short enough to exclude the probability of his denigrating physically in the interval. In some parts of southern India, the period fixed was twelve years. Thus, according to an old traveler in the province of Quilacare, there is a Gentile house of prayer in which there is an idol, which they hold in great account, and every twelve years they celebrate a great feast to it, whither all the Gentiles go as to jubilee. This temple possesses many lands and much revenue. It is a very great affair. This province has a king over it, who has not more than twelve years to reign from jubilee to jubilee. His manner of living is in this wise. 
That is to say, when the twelve years are completed, on the day of this feast, there assemble together innumerable people, and much money is spent in giving food to Brahmins. The king has a wooden scaffolding made, spread over with silken hangings, and on that day he goes to bathe at a tank with great ceremonies and sound of music. After that, he comes to the idol and prays to it, and mounts on the scaffolding, and there, before all the people, he takes some very sharp knives, and begins to cut off his nose, and then his ears, and his lips, and all his members, and as much flesh of himself as he can, and he throws it away very hurriedly, until so much of his blood is spilled, that he begins to faint, and then he cuts his throat himself, and he performs the sacrifice to the idol, and whoever desires to reign another twelve years, and undertake this martyrdom for love of the idol, has to be present looking on at this, and from that place they raise him up as king. The king of Calicut, on the Malabar coast, bears the title of Samarin, or Samari. He pretends to be of a higher rank than the Brahmins, and to be inferior only to the invisible gods, a pretension that was acknowledged by his subjects, but which is held as absurd and abominable by the Brahmins, by whom he is only treated as a sudra. Formerly, the Samorin had to cut his throat in public at the end of a twelve years' reign. But towards the end of the 17th century, the rule had been modified as follows. Many strange customs were observed in this country in former times, and some very odd ones are still continued. It was an ancient custom for the Samoran to reign but 12 years and no longer. If he died before his term was expired, it saved him a troublesome ceremony of cutting his own throat on a public scaffold erected for the purpose. He first made a feast for all his nobility and gentry, who are very numerous. After the feast, he saluted his guests and went on the scaffold and very decently cut his own throat in the view of the assembly, and his body was, a little while after, burned with great pomp and ceremony, and the grandees elected a new Samoran. Whether that custom was a religious or a civil ceremony, I know not, but it is now laid aside, and a new custom is followed by the modern Samorans, that jubilee is proclaimed throughout his dominions at the end of twelve years, and a tent is pitched for him in a spacious plain, and a great feast is celebrated for ten or twelve days, with mirth and jollity, guns firing night and day, so at the end of the feast any four of the guests that have a mind to gain a crown by a desperate action, in fighting their way through thirty or forty thousand of his guards, and kill the Samoran in his tent, he that kills him succeeds him in his empire in anno sixteen ninety five one of those jubilees happened and the tent pitched near penene a seaport of his about fifteen leagues to the southward of calicut there were but three men that would venture on that desperate action who fell in with sword and target among the guard and after they had killed and wounded many were themselves killed one of the desperados had a nephew of fifteen or sixteen years of age that kept close by his uncle in the attack on the guards, and when he saw him fall, the youth got through the guards into the tent and made a stroke at his majesty's head, and had certainly dispatched him if a large brass lamp which was burning over his head had not barred the blow. But before he could make another, he was killed by the guards, and, I believe, the same Samoran reigns yet. I chanced to come that time along the coast, and heard the guns for two or three days and nights successively. The English traveller, whose account I have quoted, did not himself witness the festival he describes, though he heard the sound of the firing in the distance. Fortunately, exact records of these festivals, and of the number of men who perished at them, have been preserved in the archives of the royal family in Calcutta. In the latter part of the 19th century, they were examined by Mr. W. Logan, with the personal assistance of the reigning king, and from his work it is possible to gain an accurate conception, both of the tragedy and of the scene where it was periodically enacted, down to 1743, when the ceremony took place for the last time. The festival at which the king of Calcutta staked his crown and his life on the issue of battle was known as the great sacrifice it fell every twelfth year when the planet jupiter was in retrograde motion in the sign of the crab and it lasted twenty-eight days culminating at the time of the eighth lunar asterism in the month of makaram 
as the date of the festival was determined by the position of Jupiter in the sky, and the interval between two festivals was 12 years, which is roughly Jupiter's period of revolution round the sun, we may conjecture that the splendid planet was supposed to be, in a special sense, the king's star, and to rule his destiny, the period of its revolution in heaven corresponding to the period of his reign on earth. However, that may be, the ceremony was observed with great pomp at the Tiranuvaye Temple, on the north bank of the Ponani River. The spot is close to the present railway lines. As the train rushes by, you can just catch a glimpse of the temple, almost hidden behind a clump of trees on the river bank. From the western gateway of the temple, a perfectly straight road, hardly raised above the level of the surrounding rice fields, and shaded by a fine avenue, runs for half a mile to a high ridge with a precipitous bank, on which the outlines of three or four terraces can still be traced. On the topmost of these terraces, the king took his stand on the eventful day. The view which it commands is a fine one, across the flat expanse of the rice fields, with the broad placid river winding through them. The eye ranges eastward to high tablelands, their lower slopes embowered in woods, while afar off looms the great chain of the western Ghats, and in the furthest distance, the Nilgaris, or Blue Mountains, hardly distinguishable from the azure of the sky above. But it was not in the distant prospect that the king's eyes naturally turned at this crisis of his fate. His attention was arrested by a spectacle nearer at hand, for all the plain below was alive with troops, their banners waving gaily in the sun, the white tents of their many camps standing sharply out against the green and gold of the rice fields. Forty thousand fighting men or more were gathered there to defend the king. But if the plain swarmed with soldiers, the road that cuts across it from the temple to the king's stand was clear of them. Not a soul was stirring on it. Each side of the way was barred by palisades, and from the palisades on either hand a long hedge of spears, held by strong arms, projected into the empty road, their blades meeting in the middle and forming a glittering arch of steel. All was now ready. The king waved his sword. At the same moment, a great chain of massy gold, enriched with bosses, was placed on an elephant at his side. That was the signal. On the instant, a stir might be seen half a mile away at the gate of the temple. A group of swordsmen, decked with flowers and smeared with ashes, has stepped out from the crowd. They have just partaken of their last meal on earth, and they now receive the last blessings and farewells of their friends. A moment more, and they are coming down the lane of spears, hewing and stabbing right and left at the spearmen, winding and turning and writhing among the blades as if they had no bones in their bodies. It is all in vain. One after the other they fall, some nearer the king, some farther off, content to die, not for the shadow of a crown, but for the mere sake of approving their dauntless valor and swordsmanship to the world. On the last days of the festival, the same magnificent display of gallantry, the same useless sacrifice of life, was repeated again and again. Yet perhaps no sacrifice is wholly useless, which proves that there are men who prefer honor to life. It is a singular custom in Bengal, says an old native historian of India, that there is little of hereditary descent in succession to the sovereignty. Whoever kills the king and succeeds in placing himself on that throne is immediately acknowledged as king. All the emirs, wazirs, soldiers, and peasants instantly obey and submit to him, and consider him as being as much their sovereign as they did their former prince, and obey his orders implicitly. The people of Bengal say, we are faithful to the throne. Whoever fills the throne, we are obedient and true to it. A custom of the same sort formerly prevailed in the little kingdom of Passier, on the northern coast of Sumatra. The old Portuguese historian de Barros, who informs us of it, remarks with a surprise that no wise man should wish to be king of Passier, since the monarch was not allowed by his subjects to live long. From time to time a sort of fury seized the people, and they marched through the streets of the city, chanting with loud voices the fatal words, "'The king must die!' when the king heard that song of death he knew that his hour had come the man who struck the fatal blow was of the royal lineage and as soon as he had done the deed of blood and seated himself on the throne he was regarded as the legitimate king provided that he contrived to maintain his seat peaceably for a single day this however the regicide did not always succeed in doing 
when for now Perez de Andrade, on a voyage to China, put in at Passier for a cargo of spices, two kings were massacred, and that in the most peaceable and orderly manner, without the smallest sign of tumult or sedition in the city, where everything went on in its usual course, as if the murder or execution of a king were a matter of everyday occurrence. Indeed, on one occasion, three kings were raised to the dangerous elevation, and followed each other in the dusty road of death in a single day. The people defended the custom, which they esteemed very laudable, and even of divine institution, by saying that God would never allow so high and mighty a being as a king, who reigned as his vicegerent on earth, to perish by violence, unless for his sins he thoroughly deserved it. Far away from the tropical island of Sumatra, a rule of the same sort appears to have obtained among the old Slavs. When the captives Gun and Jarmeric contrived to slay the king and queen of the Slavs and made their escape, they were pursued by the barbarians, who shouted after them that if they would only come back, they would reign instead of the murdered monarch, since by a public statute of the ancients, the succession to the throne fell to the king's assassin. But the flying regicides turned a deaf ear to promises which they regarded as mere baits to lure them back to destruction. They continued their fight, and the shouts and clamor of the barbarians gradually died away in the distance. When kings were bound to suffer death, whether at their own hands or at the hands of others on the expiration of a fixed term of years, it was natural that they should seek to delegate the painful duty, along with some of the privileges of sovereignty, to a substitute who should suffer vicariously in their stead. This expedient appears to have been resorted to by some of the princes of Malabar. Thus, we are informed by a native authority on that country that, in some places, all powers, both executive and judicial, were delegated for a fixed period to natives by the sovereign. This institution was styled Thalavetti Parothium, or authority obtained by decapitation. It was an office tenable for five years, during which its bearer was invested with supreme despotic powers within his jurisdiction. On the expiry of the five years, the man's head was cut off and thrown up in the air amongst a large concourse of villagers, each of whom vied with the other in trying to catch it in its course down. He who succeeded was nominated to the post for the next five years." When once kings, who had hitherto been bound to die a violent death at the end of a term of years, conceived the happy thought of dying by deputy in the persons of others, they would very naturally put it in practice, and accordingly we need not wonder at finding so popular an expedient, or traces of it in many lands. Scandinavian traditions contain some hints that of old the Swedish kings reigned only for periods of nine years, after which they were put to death, or had to find a substitute to die in their stead. Thus, Eun, or On, king of Sweden, is said to have sacrificed to Odin for a length of days, and to have been answered by the god that he should live so long as he sacrificed one of his sons every ninth year. He sacrificed nine of them in this manner, and would have sacrificed the tenth and last, but the Swedes would not allow him. So he died, and was buried in a mound at Uppsala. Another indication of a similar tenure of the crown occurs in a curious legend of the disposition and banishment of Odin. Offended at his misdeeds, the other gods outlawed him and exiled him, but set up in his place a substitute, Aller by name, a cunning wizard, to whom they accorded the symbols both of royalty and of godhead. The deputy bore the name of Odin and reigned for nearly ten years, when he was driven from the throne. While the real old came to his own again, his discomfited rival retired to Sweden and was afterwards slain in an attempt to repair his shattered fortunes. As gods are often merely men who loom large through the mists of tradition, we may conjecture that this Norse legend preserves a confused reminiscence of ancient Swedish kings who reigned for nine or ten years together, then abdicated, delegating to others the privilege of dying for their country. The great festival, which was held at Uppsala every nine years, may have been the occasion on which the king or his deputy was put to death. We know that human sacrifices formed part of the rites. There are some grounds for believing that the reign of many ancient Greek kings was limited to eight years, or at least that at the end of every period of eight years, a new consecration, a fresh outpouring of the divine grace, was regarded as necessary in order to enable them to discharge their civil and religious duties. 
Thus, it was a rule of the Spartan constitution that every eighth year the ephors should choose a clear and moonless night, and sitting down observe the sky in silence. If during their vigil they saw a meteor or shooting star, they inferred that the king had sinned against the deity, and they suspended him from his functions until the Delphic or Olympic oracle should reinstate him in them. This custom, which has all the air of great antiquity, was not suffered to remain a dead letter, even in the last period of the Spartan monarchy. For in the third century before our era, a king, who had rendered himself obnoxious to the reforming party, was actually deposed on various trumped-up charges, among which the allegation that the ominous sign had been seen in the sky took a prominent place. If the tenure of the regal office was formally limited among the Spartans to eight years, we may naturally ask, why was that precise period selected as the measure of a king's reign? The reason is probably to be found in those astronomical considerations that determine the early Greek calendar. The difficulty of reconciling lunar and solar time is one of the standing puzzles which has taxed the ingenuity of men who are emerging from barbarism. Now an octennial cycle is the shortest period at the end of which sun and moon really mark time together after overlapping, so to say, throughout the whole of the interval. Thus, for example, it is only once in every eight years that the full moon coincides with the longest or shortest day, and as this coincidence can be observed with the aid of a simple dial, the observation is naturally one of the first to furnish a base for a calendar, which shall bring lunar and solar times into tolerable, though not exact, harmony. But in early days, the proper adjustment of the calendar is a matter of religious concern, since on it depends a knowledge of the right seasons for propitiating the deities whose favor is indispensable to the welfare of the community. No wonder, therefore, that the king, as the chief priest of the state, or as himself a god, should be liable to deposition or death at the end of an astronomical period." when the great luminaries had run their course on high and were about to renew the heavenly race it might well be thought that the king should renew his divine energies or prove them unabated under pain of making room for a more vigorous successor in southern india as we have seen the king's reign and life terminated with the revolution of the planet jupiter round the sun in Greece, on the other hand, the king's fate seems to have hung in the balance at the end of every eight years, ready to fly up and kick the beam as soon as the opposite scale was loaded with a falling star. Whatever its origin may have been, the cycle of eight years appears to have coincided with the normal length of the king's reign in other parts of Greece besides Sparta. Thus Minos, king of Gnosis in Crete, whose great palace has been unearthed in recent years, is said to have held office for periods of eight years together. At the end of each period, he retired for a season to the oracular cave at Mount Ida, and there communed with his divine father Zeus, giving him an account of his kingship and the years that were past, and receiving from him instructions for his guidance in those which were to come. The tradition plainly implies that at the end of every eight years, the king's sacred powers needed to be renewed by intercourse with the godhead, and that without such a renewal, he would have forfeited his right to the throne. Without being unduly rash, we may surmise that the tribute of seven youths and seven maidens, whom the Athenians were bound to send to Minos every eight years, had some connection with the renewal of the king's power for another octennial cycle. Traditions varied as to the fate which awaited the lads and damsels on their arrival in Crete, but the common view appears to have been that they were shut up in the labyrinth, there to be devoured by the Minotaur, or at least to be imprisoned for life. Perhaps they were sacrificed by being roasted alive in a bronze image of a bull, or of a bull-headed man, in order to renew the strength of the king and of the son whom he personated. This, at all events, is suggested by the legend of Talos, a bronze man who clutched people to his breast and leaped with them into the fire, so that they were roasted alive. He is said to have been given by Zeus to Europa, or by Hephaestus to Minos, to guard the island of Crete, which he patrolled thrice daily. According to one account, he was a bull. According to another, he was the sun. Probably he was identical with the Minotaur, and stripped of his mythical features, was nothing but a bronze image of the sun represented as a man with a bull's head. 
In order to renew the solar fires, human victims may have been sacrificed to the idol by being roasted in its hollow body or placed on its sloping hands and allowed to roll into a pit of fire. It was in the latter fashion that the Carthanians sacrificed their offspring to Moloch. The children were laid on the hands of a calf-headed image of bronze, from which they slid into a fiery oven, while the people danced to the music of flutes and timbrels to drown the shrieks of the burning victims. The resemblance which the Cretan traditions bear to the Carthenian practice suggests that the worship associated with the names of Minos and the Minotaur may have been powerfully influenced by that of a Semitic ball. In the tradition of Phalaris, tyrant of Agrigentum, and his brazen bull, we may have an echo of similar rites in Sicily, where the Carthanian power struck deep roots. In the province of Lagos, the Ijibu tribe of the Yoruba race is divided into two branches, which are known respectively as the Ijibu Ode and the Ijibu Rimon. The Ode branch of the tribe is ruled by a chief who bears the title of Awujale and is surrounded by a great deal of mystery. Down to recent times, his face might not be seen even by his own subjects, and if circumstances obliged him to communicate with them, he did so through a screen which hid him from view. The other, or Rimon branch, of the Ijebu tribe is governed by a chief who ranks below the Awujale. Mr. John Parkinson was informed that in former times, this subordinate chief used to be killed with ceremony after a rule of three years. As the country is now under British protection, the custom of putting the chief to death at the end of three years' reign has long been abolished, and Mr. Parkinson was unable to ascertain any particulars on the subject. At Babylon, within historical times, the tenure of the kingly office was in practice lifelong, yet in theory it would seem to have been merely annual. For every year at the festival of Zagmuk, the king had to renew his power by seizing the hands of the image of Marduk in his great temple of Isagel in Babylon. Even when Babylon passed under the power of Assyria, the monarchs of the country were expected to legalize their claim to the throne every year by coming to Babylon and performing the ancient ceremony at the New Year festival. And some of them found the obligation so burdensome that rather than discharge it, they renounced the title of king altogether and contended themselves with the humbler one of governor. Further, it would appear that in remote times, though not within the historical period, the kings of Babylon or their barbarous predecessors forfeited not merely their crown, but their life at the end of a year's tenure of office. At least this is the conclusion to which the following evidence seems to point. According to the historian Barossus, who as a Babylonian priest spoke with ample knowledge, there was annually celebrated in Babylon a festival called Sakea. It began on the 16th day of the month loose and lasted for five days, during which masters and servants changed places, the servants giving orders and the masters obeying them. A prisoner condemned to death was dressed in the king's robes, seated on the king's throne, allowed to issue whatever commands he pleased to eat, drink, and enjoy himself, and to lie with the king's concubines. But at the end of the five days, he was stripped of his royal robes, scourged, and hanged or impaled. During his brief term of office, he bore the title of Zoganes. This custom might perhaps have been explained as merely a grim jest perpetrated in a season of jollity at the expense of an unhappy criminal. But one circumstance, the leave given to the mock king to enjoy the king's concubines, is decisive against this interpretation. Considering the jealous seclusion of an oriental despot's harem, we may be quite certain that permission to invade it would never have been granted by the despot, least of all to a condemned criminal, except for the very gravest cause. This cause could hardly be other than the condemned man was about to die in the king's stead, and that to make the substitution perfect, it was necessary he should enjoy the full rights of royalty during his brief reign. There is nothing surprising in this substitution, the rule that the king must be put to death either on the appearance of any symptom of bodily decay or at the end of a fixed period is certainly one which sooner or later the kings would seek to abolish or modify. We have seen that in Ethiopia, Sophala, and Ayo, the rule was boldly set aside by enlightened monarchs, and that in Calcutta, the old custom of killing the king at the end of twelve years was changed into a permission granted to any one at the end of the twelve years period to attack the king, and in the event of killing him, to reign in his stead. Though, as the king took care at these times to be surrounded by his guards, the permission was little more than a form. 
Another way of modifying the stern old rule is seen in the Babylonian custom just described. When the time drew near for the king to be put to death in Babylon, this appears to have been at the end of a single year's reign, he abdicated for a few days during which a temporary king reigned and suffered in his stead. At first, the temporary king may have been an innocent person, possibly a member of the king's own family. But with the growth of civilization, the sacrifice of an innocent person would be revolting to the public sentiment, and accordingly, a condemned criminal would be invested with the brief and fatal sovereignty. In the sequel, we shall find other examples of a dying criminal representing a dying god, for we must not forget that, as the case of the Shillic kings clearly shows, the king is slain in his character of a god or a demigod, his death and resurrection as the only means of perpetuating the divine life unimpaired being deemed necessary for the salvation of his people and the world a vestige of a practice of putting the king to death at the end of a year's reign appears to have survived in the festival called machaity which used to be celebrated in hawaii during the last month of the year about a hundred years ago, a Russian voyager described the custom as follows. The taboo machaity is not unlike to our festival of Christmas. It continues a whole month during which the people amuse themselves with dances, plays, and sham fights of every kind. The king must open this festival wherever he is. On this occasion, his majesty dresses himself in his richest cloak and helmet and is paddled in a canoe along the shore, followed sometimes by many of his subjects. He embarks early and must finish his excursion at sunrise. The strongest and most expert of the warriors is chosen to receive him on his landing. This warrior watches the canoe along the beach, and as soon as the king lands and has thrown off his cloak, he darts his spear at him from a distance of about 30 paces, and the king must either catch the spear in his hand or suffer from it. There is no jesting in the business. Having caught it, he carries it under his arm, with the sharp end downward, into the temple or hivu. On his entrance, the assembled multitude begin their sham fights, and immediately the air is obscured by clouds of spears, made for the occasion with blunted ends. Hamamea, the king, has been frequently advised to abolish this ridiculous ceremony, in which he risks his life every year, but to no effect. His answer always is that he is able to catch a spear as anyone on the island is to throw it at him. During the Makahedi, all punishments are remitted throughout the country, and no person can leave the place in which he commences these holidays, let the affair be ever so important. That a king should regularly have been put to death at the close of a year's reign will hardly appear improbable when we learn that to this day there is still a kingdom in which the reign and the life of the sovereign are limited to a single day. In Goyo, a province of the ancient kingdom of Congo, the rule obtains that the chief who assumes the cap of sovereignty is always killed on the night after his coronation. The right of succession lies with the chief of the Musorongo, but we need not wonder that he does not exercise it, and that the throne stands vacant. No one likes to lose his life for a few hours' glory on the Ngoyo throne. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. We will be back in two weeks with our next installment. In the meantime, you can catch up with our other pod, Midwest Covencast. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on our Patreon to gain access to additional content and exclusive coven merch. You can even join our coven by following us on social media at Midwest Covencast on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and at Midwest Coven on Twitter. You can also keep up with us on our website, MidwestCovenCast.com. Until next time, Coven, blessed be.